Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simiu. Euro 2024 is in full swing. Uh, on today's episode, we're going to react to England's narrow victory over Serbia. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about the performance in general, what maybe needs to change ahead of the game against Denmark coming up on Thursday. We're also going to focus, of course, as it is an Arsenal podcast, on the performances of our boys, Declan Rice and Bukayo Saka, who both started the game and I thought played a key role in England's victory last night. In terms of transfer stuff, there's not really that much to talk about. We'll touch on a couple of stories that are doing the rounds at the moment. We discussed Reese Nelson yesterday, who could be on his way out of the club this summer. And it's understood that Crystal Palace uh, have opened talks with Arsenal with regards to a move for the wide man. That's an interesting subject. Maybe we'll touch on that a little bit more. And I also want to touch on Benjamin Sesko as well. I know we're not going to sign him now, but I had a good look at him in the game uh, against Denmark. Slovenia uh, nicking a draw late on. I say nicking. They played quite well in the second half and probably deserved the point in the end. But we'll talk a little bit about what makes Benjamin Sesko the striker that he is and what makes him this really in-demand centre forward at this moment in time. So we're going to do all of that on this episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. If you haven't done so already, please leave a like on the video. If you're a regular, you'll know what you're going to get by now. If you're an audio listener, then please do leave us a review because, of course, that really does help as well. And uh, without further ado, then let's get into it. Let's talk England's narrow victory over Serbia. Gareth Southgate's side narrowly beat Serbia last night by a goal to nil over in Gelsenkirchen. And look, with the format of this competition, with the fact that the four best third place teams also go through as well, a victory in your opening game is as good as having one leg um, in the next round, I would say, or one foot, however the saying goes. It really does feel that way. So if I were an England fan, I wouldn't have any concern uh, or anxiety about their ability to progress from this group because I think they've gone... 60 70 percent of the way just by doing um what they did last night and i think that's probably on paper the toughest game that they've got i think the danes were a really strong side not that long ago but in their last tournament didn't perform and they were, i saw enough in the second half yesterday to feel like they're not capable of causing england any problems and i'd probably say the same about slovenia as well so i think england are really in a really strong position so there's no need to overreact to what happened last night and there's no need to go overboard on the performance but it was a performance I think that raised more questions um, than answers really and I think that is fair to say. Let's focus in on our players. Uh, Bukayo Saka obviously provided the assist for the game uh, winning goal. Uh, Jude Bellingham brilliant run proper Jude Bellingham wasn't it to arrive in the box time and perfect and power a header into the back of the net. Saka of course the one who produced the cross yes it took a deflection on its way. But I thought Saka was key in that first half an hour where I thought England actually played quite well. What he did was maintain the width on that right-hand side. And with England's left side the way it is, with Trippier, a right-footed player playing at left-back, and Phil Foden, who's by no means a winger, being sort of sho shoehorned into that position, it felt like England really needed some width from somewhere. And so it was even more important that Bukayo Saka provided that from the right. With Bukayo Saka, he's one of those players, right, where everything he does, it looks quite simple, like it's simple on the eye, but it's so, so effective. You know, the layoffs, the dropping of the shoulder, the changes of direction. It's never like Neymar style stepovers and, and all of that stuff. You don't get that when it comes to Bukayo Saka, but what you do get is someone who's incredibly effective, incredibly hardworking, protects his fullback better than most as well. Um, and I thought, he was really intelligent in the way he played the game last night because it would have been quite easy actually to end up 
drifting into the areas, for example, that Trent Alexander-Arnold wanted to get into, playing in the midfield last night, but obviously having that tendency out of habit more than anything else to go out to that right-hand side. I thought between them, they worked it well in that first half an hour in terms of not getting in each other's feet, not getting in each other's way. Would I have liked to have seen a bit more from Bukayo Saka? Like, would I have liked to have seen more take-ons? Maybe. Would I have liked to have seen him try to create some opportunities for himself? Probably. But you've got to remember, this is a guy that's only played, what, 25 minutes of football um, in the lead up to this tournament. He hasn't been fit. You know, some people were saying that he might not even start last night. Now, we know that when push comes to shove for Gareth Southgate, for Mikel Arteta, for anybody that manages this guy, they want him in the team. But if he was left out last night, I don't think it would have been a massive shock or surprise because of the fact he's had so little build up to the competition. I also thought Declan Rice was really, really important to England last night. His ability to clean up in midfield, um, anticipate, intercept. Um, I thought he did a really, really good job of that. Pretty much most of the time, Serbia tried to play their way through the lines and get out of the low block that they were forced into in that first half an hour or so. And when he's got Trent Alexander-Arnold next to him, who, as brilliant as he is on the ball, is always talked about as not being defensively sound enough. And then he's got Jude Bellingham, who's got obviously that freedom to go and roam and get into different areas of the pitch. It is quite a a big job and it demands a lot of responsibility. And if you go back to the beginning of the 23-24 season for Arsenal, we were talking a lot about this. We constantly referred to the fact that Declan Rice was essentially playing in midfield by himself. And I think at times last night, he had to do that. I think Gareth Southgate recognised that. And that's why he ended up bringing on Conor Gallagher when he did, because he knew that Declan Rice needed a bit more support, needed a bit more energy next to him. And so England could see out the game. Southgate's got a lot of stick, as he always does, it seems, um, after England fail to uh, blow somebody away. But the truth is, like, I think we're in this weird space where we look at international management through the lens of club management. And the truth is that they're completely different things. Um, to manage at a club, means you have the day-to-day. -day. It means you have those relationships, the rapport, and you're able to create a machine um, whereby everybody knows their job. Yeah, you can make tweaks and adjustments to it, but the, the basics, the core principles are there. International management is different. I think it's about creating the right environment for those players that are so effective at their clubs coming and doing it on the international stage. The problem is, is that that form doesn't always translate. Um, look at Phil Foden, for example. You know, he seemed completely lost yesterday. And people will say, well, it's because he played out on the left-hand side. I thought Cesc Fabregas was spot on in his analysis. What a brilliant punditry performance that was from him, by the way. Um, worlds apart from Rio and, and Micah Richards. As good characters as they are, they're not on the same level as Cesc in terms of punditry. But yeah, I just thought it was really interesting when Cesc turned around and said, well, yeah, fine, he's playing out on the left-hand side, but he's got a drift. He's got to go and he's got to want to get on the ball and he's got to want to make things happen. And I'm not seeking to dig out Phil Foden because I think he's an incredibly talented player. The point I'm trying to make is that what you see on sort of a weekly basis at club level is not always translatable to international football because the environment is different. The style is different. The people around you are different. You're not building a team around any one individual on the international stage unless you've got that real standout talent. And, you know, Gareth Southgate, probably was thinking about playing Foden as a 10. At least he would have considered it, maybe. And, you know, in the end, given that Bellingham performed the way he did and Bellingham scored the winning goal, I think you can say that Gareth was justified in going with Bellingham as the one that was going to play in his more comfortable role rather than dropping him a little bit deeper in order to facilitate Foden as a 10. Um, I do think England lacked width, though, on that left-hand side. And the fact that they were just really unwilling to approach play down that left-hand side was a concern. And I think against the better teams, they'll just, you know, stop you making it work down the right and not really worry too much about that left-hand side. They'll put extra resource into defending one side and against the very, very best, you know, you're, you're going to struggle on that. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I think um, he's got a lot of adjustments that he needs to make. He's got a lot of uh, thinking to do after this game. and. Um, you know, in time, I'm sure uh, England will perform better. I think, you know, how many times over the years have I looked at a team in a tournament and said, well, you know, they look rubbish in the first game, but then they've gone on to do really, really well. You can grow into tournaments. It's a very unique um, sort of style of football, tournament football. 
there isn't that intensity that we see in the Premier League. There isn't that, um, you know, energy in terms of the presses. It is very, very different. Teams will sit off you. Um, I think because there's a big chasm between the quality of some of the teams, you're going to get those more negative game plans. And then when you're playing against the very best, you'll look at the best and say, well, why aren't you breaking them down? But actually, it's incredibly difficult to do that when someone sets up with five at the back and then four in front of them and then just the lone striker. So, yeah, I, I, look, I don't want to go overboard on the performance, but I thought Saka and, and Rice showed their value from an Arsenal perspective last night to this team. The Trent Alexander-Arnold midfield experiment, did it work? Not for me, not last night. Um, I've mentioned Foden already. Harry Kane was completely anonymous, had two touches of the ball in the first half. But again, is that because Harry Kane's become a bad player overnight? No, it's not. Um, it's just to do with the team and the way um, it's all put together. And I don't really know what the answer is um, with the Kane thing. You know, he is England's best centre forward by quite some distance. So he's got to play. And I'm sure when he gets his moment, he will he will make a difference. He probably should have added a second for England last night, but for a really good save. Um, but yeah, Southgate's got some thinking to do. But look, how deep can you go on this? How overboard can you go on a manager who's just won the game and put his team in a prime position, especially with the other two drawing as well, to go through as group winners now? Um, so yeah, I think England will go through comfortably and there's not that much to worry about. Some thinking to do, as I say, but yeah, that, that's it really. Um, how can you get a little bit more out of some of your really talented players without it being as kind of lopsided as it is now. Because right now what England are doing, and okay, it's due to availability, but what you're doing is you're getting loads out of Saka, you're getting loads out of Bellingham, but maybe at the expense of getting something out of Foden. I think against the very best, you probably need to find a way of getting something out of everybody because Bellingham will be a marked man when they play France, for example. Saka will be a marked man when they play the Germans or whatever, or the, whoever it is that they're going to meet. Do you see what I mean? So I think you need to be able to get a little bit more out of everybody to give yourselves that unpredictability and put yourselves in a position where you can seriously go on and win the tournament. Nobody doubts that England will get through the group. Nobody doubts that they'll probably do it as group winners. But there are some things that need working on and Gareth Southgate's got a few days now to sit and mull over it and come to some decisions. Um, a player who's in action today is uh, Artem Dovbik, uh, the Ukrainian striker, someone that I've read some reports is being linked with Arsenal this morning, had a really good campaign for Girona in La Liga, was the top scorer in the league. Ukraine take on Romania today. Uh, that's going to be an interesting game. And um, yeah, Dovbik is one to keep an eye on. I tipped him on TalkSport as um, someone to look at for top goal scorer because I think that's a group that Ukraine are capable of scoring goals in. And looking at his form over the course of the season and what he carries into the Euros, there's no reason why he can't be a serious uh, a serious contender uh, for that. But just before I sign out, and it's a really, really brief, short episode today, I know. Um, but I do want to touch on Benjamin Sesko because I sort of kind of allowed myself to get sucked into the whole we should sign this guy after I did my scouting report episode on him uh, not that long ago. and. Although I was on board with it, I think the one reservation I had was how involved is he in football matches outside of shots on goal? And the truth is that when you look at the statistics, when you go back and you look over how he fared uh, last season, you look at all the metrics in detail, you can make the case and make the argument that at times he can be a little bit of a passenger. Now, I'm not saying that that means he's a bad player, because I think you can say the same of Erling Haaland, and I don't think any of us would sit there and say that Erling Haaland isn't a good footballer or isn't a useful weapon to have in your armory. But what I wanted to do um, yesterday when I sat down to watch Slovenia against Denmark was have a good look at Benjamin Sesko because this was Slovenia against the team that they are capable of, the, of at the very least competing with. If I'd have watched Sesko against England been really, really uninvolved and came away from that saying, well, he's not the guy for us anyway because he hardly had a sniff, he hardly had a touch and disregarded the golfing quality between the two teams, I'd be doing the player a disservice and I don't think that's fair. So that's why the Denmark game was an interesting one for me. It gave me the opportunity to have a look at him in a game where his team were capable of competing. And they certainly did that in the second half. They managed to get an equaliser, a slight bit of fortune about the deflection uh, that led to that equaliser after Christian Eriksen had, of course, put the Danes in front before half time. But 
a lot of the things that I looked at and kind of drew up in terms of conclusions uh, when uh, doing that scouting report were on show and on display to me. What he has got is this incredible appetite for shooting on sight. Ball dropped to him in that second half beautifully and he struck it and it came back off the frame of the goal. Really, really unlucky. Um, and he is someone that will probably only need one or two sniffs in a game um, to make a difference. And you feel like as he gets older, as he gets more mature, as he kind of, you know, builds up experience, he's only going to get better in that sense in terms of being a real moments and clutch player. But I don't think he was involved in Slovenia's build-up play probably anywhere near enough. I think because he's so big and because he's so dominating physically, I think that does do something without him necessarily having to touch the ball. Like if you work the ball wide and Benjamin Sesko stands at the near post, for example, you are going to naturally get defenders drawn towards him, which could open spaces up for others. So I'm not saying you always have to touch the ball to be like involved or to be making a difference in a phase of play. But I would argue that a lot of the points that I made in that scouting report about Benjamin Sesko maybe being on the periphery is just a little bit too much for my liking. I think we're confirmed uh, by what we saw yesterday. Obviously, it's early days, um, early in the tournament. Like Harry Kane was rubbish last night, but you're not going to sit here and say he's a bad striker. So I'm not drawing too many conclusions, but I, I kind of felt better about the fact that the, the conclusions I'd come to were actually quite similar to what my eyes were telling me and what my eyes were seeing when I sat down to watch him uh, in that game for Slovenia last, uh, was it last night? Like yesterday evening, a late afternoon, however you want to put it. But anyway, um, yeah, so uh, England, big victory for them. Uh, one foot in the next round, as I say, but some work to be done. The Trent Alexander-Arnold experiment, do you continue with that? I'm not so sure. Uh, the left-hand side, completely ineffective. Uh, the right-hand side, Effective for half an hour, but the level dropped off for England. I think, look, just to wrap up on, on today's show and on England, if I had one concern, it would be the way the level dropped in the second half. Um, is it a fitness thing? Uh, nobody's going to tell me that the England players are less fit than the Serbian players, um, but it just felt like the level really, really dropped off. And I honestly do believe this. This might be a controversial take. If Dusan Tadic had been on the pitch 10 minutes longer, Serbia could have quite easily found an equalising goal. I really do believe that. The only other thing I want to say as well, um, just before we say goodbye, and I know I said I was going to say goodbye, but I'm rambling on a little bit, is Jude Bellingham. Unbelievable talent, unbelievable story, and a real asset to this England side. And he's proven to be an incredible signing for Real Madrid as well. Okay, No doubt about how good this guy is. But did his confidence last night kind of spill over the edge and become arrogance to the point where it was almost a little bit cringe? Like, I found myself cringing at moments with Jude Bellingham yesterday, like constantly looking up at the screen, um, you know, referring to himself in third person after the game it was a little bit weird to me. Um, I didn't like that whole incident where he sort of smashed into the defender where he walked over to him and just like barged him. And I know that some people will say, oh, well, it's good because England have got a bit of edge and that's what they've been missing and it's great to see. And, you know, he's just fighting for the shirt and he cares and all of that jazz. That's fine. But just think about what the reaction would have been had Alexander Mitrovic done that. And there you can see that it was probably just a little bit over the line. Like It wasn't two players giving it to one another. It wasn't a confrontation in which Jude Bellingham felt he needed to maybe strike first or, or, or stand his ground. Obviously, he went a bit further than standing his ground. But I just, to me, it was just a little bit like, what are you doing, mate? Like, wind it in a little bit. You're a great footballer. You're a fantastic talent. You've been talked about as being incredibly mature for your age and how likable you are has made a big difference in the perception of you. Um, and that is all great. Don't spoil it by trying to be the pantomime villain uh, just so you can get more camera time. I, I, I don't know. I know that most people would disagree with my take on this, but I found it just a little bit too much from Jude Bellingham yesterday. Scored the winning goal. Great contribution. Nobody's denying that for a second. But do you need to become an S-house when, to me, it all felt a little bit forced yesterday? 
That's my take on it. Let me know your thoughts on it in the comments section below. Three more Euro 2024 games uh, to come today on Monday. And we'll touch on um, the biggest stories from those on tomorrow's episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. Thank you for joining me as always. And I'll see you all on the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves. All the best. 